were driving down the road. There was two carloads of us. We were gonna go up to drink over by Camarillo State Hospital when we saw a car full of people from Black Mafia, which is a gang in Oxnard, and they're all blacks. So I tried to chase him down in my car and I ended up smashing his car at Mills and Main in Ventura and then dragging his car about 20 feet. And when I went to back up to go away, I couldn't because my car was stuck to his car. So all of us jumped out of our cars and I had a screwdriver and we were beating, beating, trying to beat them up, trying to stab them. And I ended up chasing the one in the driver's seat who I was after all the way back to his house, which was about three blocks away. And I kicked in his door and ended up stabbing him three times in front of his mom, his seven-year-old brother, his three-year-old sister. And he ended up paralyzed in one leg. My dad went to prison and I needed money to put on his books. So I called him up. I knew this guy like 15 years. So I called him up and I told him, uh, I need a couple hundred dollars from you. My dad just went back to prison. I want to send him some money. I don't send my dad like $200, $300. I like to send him like $900 to $1,000 so that I don't have to deal with him the rest of the time he's in prison. I mean, if he can't live off $1,000, well, that's his problem, not mine. So I call, he told me, you'll get your money when I feel damn good and ready. I told him, well, I think you're damn good and ready. So I drove down to Van Nuys and I kicked in his screen door and I had him by his throat and I was punching him in the face, screaming at him to give me my money. I didn't realize his mom was in the back bedroom. And when I threw him on the ground, I kicked him in his face. And when I kicked him in his face, his head hit the wall heater, those old wall heaters, and it split his head open for us. He gave him 75 stitches. So I got convicted for residential burglary. If you had something that I believed was mine, like you owed me money or you disrespected me and caused and made me feel like the people who I was, who else owed me money or were going to have less respect for me because I let you get away with something that couldn't happen. So if I felt in any way you were hindering my balance with everybody and the respect everybody had for me, then I was kicking in your door and whether I had to smack your mom or smack your dad or smack you really didn't matter to me because in the big picture, you're insignificant because you're not part of my plan. You're just in the way of my plan.
Doc, can you take off? Is he coming back? Oh. Um, well, we vacation runs from about two to four. Oh, it's you got out? No, I've been out. But... Okay, you got the wrong form. Oh, an initial one. Yeah, that's the guy's just got out. Report, right? I uh, I paged him and I did a walk around. I couldn't find him. So is there anything you should go? I put my monthly in there. Okay, yeah, but just a monthly, yeah. Yeah. He, I just come in twice a month. Okay, yeah, you did what you had to do. So. Right. Parole is a law unto itself. To be convicted of a violation on parole, we only got to be 50% guilty. They only got to find you 51% guilty. In a court of law, they got to find you like 96% guilty. I hate going to see him. I come up for review in three more months. If they decide they were still going to keep me on, which most likely they will, that's when Sacramento will review my case. But I haven't exactly been a good parole participant, so I'm sure I'll have to continue for the next 17 months or so. I haven't had a dirty test in my life. I haven't had an 11 by 50 in nine years, eight years, and they still make me piss test. They don't reinstitute us in the society. You come out here and they say, be here, do this, do this, do that, and that's it. Or you're going back to jail. I don't like your mouth. You're going back to jail. I was thinking about drawing some stuff and putting it on the internet. I don't know what I want to draw, though. Probably what sells. I'll draw a bunch of demons and... <laughs> You know, the whole reason why I started talking to him was because of the tattoos and piercings. Because I've always been attracted to tattoos and piercings, and I don't know, it wasn't his whole bad boy attitude that got me, it was him. And he actually can be caring and gentle underneath what he's done in the past. I did meet him once before I actually really started falling in love with him, but he's just, he's got a way, and he just knows how to touch you, he really does. So that's how I came to love him, I guess. He came over to visit my daughter after they'd been talking on the phone while he was in prison. Right? Yeah. Um, he came over to meet my daughter one night, and I really didn't like him. Number one, he was from prison, and I just, I'm, I'm leery about people with uh, prison records and everything from, uh, because of my past involvement with my ex-husband, and I don't know, because um, he was into drugs and everything, I just... It did not go over very well at first. <laughs> so I, d I didn't want it around. Not many people even liked hearing about him or anything. She asked me if he didn't have anywhere to stay when he got out. It'd just be for a little bit, Mom. A couple of weeks, maybe. Can he come stay here? And I don't like seeing people out on the street because I've been there. So I, you know, I said fine. And that was all... I ever wanted was for him to have a chance. I'm not and you I'm not emotionally equipped to deal with family life <laughs> or with people anymore. I've kind of detached from everything. So, I'm you know, I'm not easy to live with. Um When I pulled up to Delano, it was Delano Prison. I was sentenced out of LA County. We pulled up there and all of a sudden there were guards walking up and down the catwalks with big M1s, big old signs that said warning, no warning shots. And then you get this big speech where they're yelling at you, this is a level three, level four yard, people die on this yard. I mean, it's, it's a big old speech about you may not get out. So I was real nervous then, I was 18 years old. And from Delano, I got sent to San Quentin because Delano had a TB epidemic. So they sent me to San Quentin to a reception up there which is an old prison with a lot of blind spots, a lot of people can die there. So then I got kind of scared, and then when I went to a level four yard at Pelican Bay, well that's when all of a sudden your whole life, what are you seeing on TV, Pelican Bay this, Pelican Bay is on the news, right, it's this, right, that, I was scared. 
So at 18 on a four yard with murderers, lifers, I didn't feel I belonged there, but I, I guess I fit in just fine. <laughs> They come over to the bullhorn and they yell for you to wake up. It's time to get up, and that's at five in the morning. So you got to be out of bed, wash up. You eat by 6:30. If you don't go down to eat, you don't have to. But if you don't go down to eat, then you don't get lunch because right after you eat on your way back, and it's all controlled feeding. In other words, is they call a section at a time. You go in whatever order you're on your way down there, and once you sit down, you're not allowed to get up. If you get up, they do have block guns and stuff like that that they will fire at you because they assume if you're standing during any controlled movement, then what a controlled movement is, if they're moving you from point A to point B and you move out of whatever the movement is, then you're probably gonna hurt somebody. So they don't take any chances, they'll shoot you. Maybe not with live ammo, but they'll shoot you with block guns, which are big pieces of wood about that big. They'll knock you down. There's a lot of gangs in California, but to put all these different gangs in prison, it'd be insane for all of them to be beating each other up. So if you're from Southern California, it's, you go by area code 714-213-805-661. That way, you're, you got different cars, they call it, but you don't have, you're not allowed to beat each other up unless there's a problem. And it's easier to distinguish between a group of 30 or 40 than it is to distinguish between a group of 800 and 900. <laughs> every dorm or every yard has what they call MAC reps and yard reps. So for every building, your race votes up one person as a mouthpiece, and that person is who talks to the cops if there's any trouble. So and that mouthpiece represents that whole race. The blacks have one, the Mexicans have one, the whites have one, and the others have one. The others are Indians, um, Chinese, Japanese, those are all others. So they got their own little car. So they sit down once a week with a cop, a CO, and what they do is they get, get information from us. They go there and they write down what programs they want to see, but each of us is allotted like a four hour block of time. So the TV split up between races. Everything in there split up between races. The yard split up between races. The TV split up between races. The newspaper split up between races. Tables where you go eat, split up between races. These ones right here, the lightning bolts, are for putting in work against black people. So I was a skinhead for 12 years. The swastikas were for being involved within riots for racial reasons on the yard. And the Southern Californias for being on the front line for over two or three times. So it's for standing up for my race and my color and handling what I'm supposed to in prison. If you get caught eating after a black man in jail, then you're gonna get hurt, you're gonna get stabbed, and you're gonna, you could die. You eat after a black guy, you smoke a cigarette after a black guy, you use any utensil, drink out of a coffee cup after him, anything. Their major thing is the crutch. Oh well, the whites owe us this, the whites owe us that, and so it turned into, I started getting mad because I feel that I mean, the bloodiest war in history, the Civil War, you have a nation split itself apart, and they, I mean, millions of people died in that war, thousands, for them. And to me, at, to my, I was, that's how I'm justifying everything to me. Because how can we owe them anything when we split ourselves in half and destroyed, almost destroyed a nation? Well, there's anger. I mean, there's anger having to grow up by myself since I was 11 years old. There's anger that my dad beat me and tried to kill me. There's, I mean, there's a bunch of anger there, but I refuse to use, I don't, I refuse to use any of my past as a crutch for the things I've done. Every decision I made, I made consciously and accepted the consequences that came with it. There's never been a crime or a, anybody that I've hit or done something to that I didn't think about and accept whatever consequences came with it. So... I mean, in some ways, that's probably worse than people who do things and, and don't even think about the consequences. But the fact was, that's the way I grew up. I grew up on the streets, and I lived by every law on the street. And that's how I got to where I was. That's how I got to make all the money. That's how I got to have everybody respect me, is because I handled my business. Nobody handled it for me. And pretty soon, you get so wrapped up in, in, in what you're doing that it becomes what you are. And to me, what I was, was God.
Ain't got no mama. When you talk to a person about his circumstances away from himself, then you can have an open conversation because a person don't have to be defensive. And George was one of the people that just honest. I remember this him because he's one of the guys just say it like it is. And don't try to sugarcoat, don't try to, you know, build you up. And we became pretty comfortable together because we both was pretty honest. I wasn't trying to impress him, he wasn't trying to impress me. It was just two men talking beyond all the politics, the skin, culture, everything. So I remember that day when George came in and it was just basically just looking at him. And the first question I asked him, I think I remember asking him, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? And you know, one of them breaths came just like, you know, pretty much yes. And you know, I just start talking and asked, I think I remember asking him to close his eyes and just start talking. You know, sometimes you can talk to a person's life. And you know, and just to realize that here's somebody that never met me, can talk about things that happened or how I feel, my deepest thoughts and my deepest feelings. It had to be something, you know, spirit felt, or uh, something in the spirit. And I think that took us beyond the skin. We go and we're sitting in this little room. It's like an interview room and we're waiting for him. And then he comes and sits down and it's this big black guy. And I was like, oh man. There's a few men I'm talking right now, you know, make me statements like, it's a big improvement for me just sitting in the room with you. <laughs> we started talking about friends of mine that he knew. I got a couple friends that are on death row. I got one that just got the death penalty. I got another one that's facing 666 years right now. And a lot of these men had to become concrete. And unfortunately, in situations such as jail, prison, they find that the concrete just don't crack it, it shatters. I could walk into numerous houses and walk in there and so a girl would be sitting in there with her husband and I can tell her, take, kick all your friends out, go make me something to eat. I got laundry in the car, I need to use your room for a minute and go in there and break up my drugs and do whatever I wanted, and nobody would say nothing. That's just the way it was. Nobody was gonna argue with it. If somebody came and flipped me off, I would write down the license plate and call somebody and have them go over there and take care of it. If I had people in the car with me, all I had to do was point. There's, there's, there's a law among skinheads, really, and it's wrong, right, or indifferent. I've talked to men who had their first sex with their moms, even oral sex with their own mothers, where their mothers got drunk and molested them at 12 and 13 years old. Had men that had sex with their eight-year-old eight -year daughters and don't know how they're gonna cope with that the rest of their lives. Had to tie off straps on their parents' arm to shoot the hair on because they were shaking so bad. And these carries with these men throughout their lives. What really looks crazy and out of control to you looks normal to me. Two guys beating each other up over a word and stabbing each other. That's just life. That's, that's what happens when you do things that you know you're not supposed to. A whole family sitting in a room with their arms around each other, watching TV and taking care of each other no matter what, I don't understand. These men are victims. I know we see them as the crime and they're hurting people and robbing their own communities, but they too are victims. None of us know what a man walk around with. You know, especially a man like George. Nobody, you can meet this man. He can walk up in front of your church and all you see is tattoos. But all I see is that's just a symbol of what that man came through. That's just a sign. It's just like when a baby comes through a womb, that baby is not what you, you know, what you really want to look at until it's washed off. None of it makes sense. Gangs don't make sense. A gang is fighting for a city block that they're paying rent on. I mean, it, I mean, it doesn't really make sense. They're calling it theirs and they're dying for it, but it's not theirs. They're still their moms and their dads. They're still paying rent to some guy or mortgage or something to somebody. It doesn't belong to any of them, especially to die for. But yet they're dying for it. When I sit in front of a man, I want to be the best friend he ever had. And the best way to do that is just be honest with him. I have to give him a sugar tip. Not to sit there and build him up or pump him up, but just say, hey, a couple of days, uh, weeks ago, I had a man come in and every week he come in, not a, just, I'm reading my Bible every day, I'm blessing people, I'm praying to God, every, and I just had to stop him. I said, stop, man. I said, when are you gonna stop being phony? I said, every week I come up and talk to you and you're just talking. 
and you're not doing anything. You're one of the worst career guys in the section. I see you don't know I'm in a bubble, but I see you. I said, don't impress me. I said, I don't have a heaven to hell to put you in. There's only one to a box. This is about you. Everybody's always told me, is this what you want? You want to be here? Well, who cares? I've been here before. Here's not bad for me. I am here. It's life. See, I came from a situation where my father, uh, he kind of took off and took care of another family. And so me and my mother and sister end up living in a deep poverty situation where it was almost abandoned building. You know, with rats and all of these things. And me and my sister both su suffered wounds from those kind of things. That's a prison I never wish on nobody. When I'm sitting in my cell, I don't like myself. I don't like the things I've done. I don't like the bridges I've burned. I don't like the fact that I'm alone in life. I just, I can't do the time no more. I say, first of all, I say, you gotta die. It's no compromise. We're not killers. We're not dope addicts. None of us are perfect. You're not worried about where you came from, what you came through. He's concerned with where you are. Sometimes we, we just act like our environment. We become our environment. And sometimes we lose ourselves because we've been at something else for so long. Life isn't fair. We make life what it is. And unless we have a relationship with God, it'll never be anything. I've been out. I think I got out June 10th of this year. Everybody's grown up and or gone or dead. <laughs> All my friends are either dead or shot themselves or so far gone on drugs or gone crazy. I got two strikes. I got no rights. I'm going to have no social security. I've been selling drugs all my life. I got nothing. I mean, the road I'm on, I can't drive the car no more because every time I drive, I hit something. So and that's something I hit. I'm not like most people. I can't go out and get in a little bit of trouble. Because once I'm in that little bit of trouble, well, i got to take it all the way. Because I'm going to do years. And I, I've run myself out. My friend was in jail with him in Ventura County. And one day, he just handed the phone to George. <laughs> and George and I just started talking. We went to the movies last week and that's pretty much what it is. Most of the time I've noticed he likes to stay indoors just because I think he's afraid of how he might react to certain situations, which is understandable because of his past. He's been doing so well out here in Ventura County and I mean by parole he's not supposed to be out here, but his parole officer said that Thousand Oaks was within his jurisdiction. Well, I th I knew it wasn't. I think I know George knew, but didn't want to admit it. And technically, he was just listening to his pro officer. His pro officer said to come stay here, so you know that's what he did. But now his pro officer is upset with him because once again George got underneath his skin. I disagree with the way he treats George, and I honestly hope that he shows his other parolees a lot more respect than what he shows George, because he shows absolutely no respect, no kindness, no compassion, no nothing for George. It's just whatever. He doesn't care, as long as he gets his money for him. He always had money before. I mean, he's lived a better lifestyle than what we have here. Here it's kind of like hand to mouth, where before he always had the cash to go buy him the best of the clothes, the cars, or whatever he wanted. And it's a big adjustment and he's still adjusting. Let me see the phone, baby. Let me call Tiomi. Who? Tommy, Tiomi. See, I'm a free man now. I can drive, talk on the phone, chew bubble gum. Hey, Tommy, we're on PCH right now. 
And hey, Joaquin's with me too. You're gonna be on camera. Not you. <laughs> All right. So they have my name at the gate, right? All right. All right. Bye. Now the car's in my name and I got my driver's license right here. Matter of fact, first time since 10 years or so. Got my driver's license, my car's registered in my name. I don't owe anybody anything, I don't have anybody holding anything over my head, well, except for the parts of my car. <laughs> I'm working that off. car I'm working on right now putting an engine in it me and my dad it's her car no that's the one but we ripped the motor out of it because the motor froze so I've been more free in the past two months than I've been the whole time I've been out so we'll pick up the motor later today and we'll probably put it in next Friday When they arrested me, I had ten thousand dollars in my pocket, seven thousand dollars in my, or ten thousand in my glove box, seven thousand in my pocket, a quarter pound of glass, which I mean an ounce of it. That's that's four ounces right there. An ounce of it goes for nine hundred bucks. They took a six-bedroom house, a Cadillac Esc two thousand two Cadillac Escalade, uh, BMW ninety nine BMW, and I had a twenty gauge side by side side by side shotgun in the back. And the only thing I got out with was two hundred dollars. Nothing that I've done for the past 12, 13, 14 years of my life makes sense to me anymore. I mean, I'm wore out. My hands have been shattered, busted, beaten up, overheating people with. I just can barely bend my fingers all the way. It's just not, can't do it no more. My life and everything starts from this time when I got out. Everything from 11 years old to 26 years old is all dead. There's no life there. George, do you publicly declare that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? With all my heart. And with all our hearts, George, we agree in Jesus' name for brand new transformation and even further anointing of the Holy Spirit as we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I couldn't hate people the way you have to hate people anymore. I can't keep everybody pushed away for the rest of my life. I made a promise to God that if everything works out and I can get out here, then I would give him a chance, and that's what I've done. I, I took somebody else and put him in my place. I handed over my whole operation to him, and um, it was good timing, pretty much. I'm a two-striker, so I'm kind of allowed to step down if I want to. I'm not really pushed in to do it, taking care of anything. The hardest part of my days is not calling my friends up and telling them, 
I need this, I need that, because I could, I could call my old friends, I could get money, I could do this, I could do that if I really wanted to, but in a lot of ways, I'm richer now than I was then, because I have freedom, I have um, peace of mind, I don't have anybody chasing me, I mean, nobody's trying to stab me, nobody's trying to rob me, nobody's trying just to be my friend so they can do my drugs. He's still working, but I have everything that he's promised me I would have. He said I would grow and I would get these things and I'm getting them. They're coming. I think George have a very good chance. But that's up to George and not up to anybody else because if he developed that right relationship with God, he would never want to walk away from it. And even though we may slip or we may uh, stumble in the process, but the thing is not about to fall, it's about getting back up. He's done so well, you know, changing his life since he's been out. So. I'm sure there's thoughts that he'd like to go back and get the quick cash, you know, for something he needs or wants. But for the most part, um, he's really trying out here. I don't uh, consciously think he's, or I don't think he's going to consciously choose to go back. We become so conformed to a certain lifestyle, to where we had to exist, where we had to survive. And that become part of who we are, and then we come out in the world and try to exist as this new person around the same people that knew us as what we were. I don't think he's going to relapse into drugs or anything. If he ends up back in, it'll be because um, he'll probably be involved in a roundabout way of something that happened, and they'll strike him you know, just to get him off the street because of his background. A lot of times we push these men back into what they're used to and where they're comfortable. I mean, people come to church and don't let him sit next to him. He's a child molester. He was in prison, you know, and chasing them right out of the church with, with... If you make it feel like a jail or he's sentenced to here and I'm going to watch everything he does, he's, go he's going to kind of like, well, why do I have to be here? I can just, you know, go out on the street and get better better treatment, better treatment from his friends and go back to the way he was. If you're strong enough to pick a man up, you should be strong enough to carry him. And if you can't carry him, don't pick him up because he's already been dropped enough. I think he's doing really good in the strives, you know, the, the steps he's taken. He has a couple more to do, um, and he knows that. But uh, for the whole, I, th I think he will make it. I only know two emotions, and that's either everything's all right or everything's not. And if everything's not, then it's nothing but hatred. So I try and stay away from everything's not all right. <laughs> I've been running on the streets since I was 11. My dad's a hell's angel. So all my life, racism and everything's been there, and I kind of fit in with the beliefs that the skinheads I hung out with were. So take care of your own race. I mean, abide by certain certain rules to where we're only better, trying to better ourselves as much sense as it made at the time.
And then when I started delving into different reasons to validate the racism, it came out to be, well, the blacks are a prime target. They don't like white people. The black people I met weren't the black people running around working and stuff today. They're gang members and they're jumping you in because you're white. And so the racism stems from not only my family, but from the experiences I had with them as gang members and stuff like that. Most people see my tattoos or they see and they just want to stay away from me or they don't want me near their stuff or if I'm in their house, they whisper to their son or their daughter while they go upstairs, stay in the living room and watch the house while he's there. I've got anger sometimes because I don't have no money in my pocket or I can't go where I want or buy what I want. The frustration now is I'm in a position where I control nothing. Everything I do is either paid for by somebody, supported by somebody, and that's the hardest way for me to live. I was under investigation for murder. I still am. And uh, over, well, they just think I was there involved or something, whatever they think. So, Ventura County issued a warrant for my arrest and they raided Liz's house for me, but I wasn't living there. So my lawyer informed me not to go to work or do nothing because the warrant was so old they should have never brought it up in the first place. It was kind of like harassment. So uh, anyway, my lawyer went to court and they dismissed it that day. I didn't even have to appear. That's how petty it was. So, but my life's good. People out here drive me crazy. But I'm adapting. Am I adapting, babe? I haven't hit nobody since I got out of prison. Uh, people like George who realize, you know, one more strike and I may be out. Uh, these are people strong enough to just to, just to realize, okay, I got to change. And if I do turn and go back, you know, this may be the end. I'm going to say something just from a new person's point of view. My name's George, I don't know everybody here. I'm the one who was growing up and the mom's all said, don't hang out with him. For real, let everybody know I just got out of prison three weeks ago and this is, I was a bad person for a long time, eight years in the system. And it's the first time I got out and, and I've got a little bit with God in there and they blessed me with my girlfriend Liz and her mom. I got a parole address and everything. And she said, if you're gonna stay here, you're going to church. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I'm a two striker, so I, I don't even like going outside. <laughs> now I'm in front of a bunch of people I don't know, and okay. But I'm here, and, and I got to hear you last week about Father, and that helped a lot. But from a new point, from someone new here, there's I haven't been to all that many churches, but I've been around every sort of person from really good people to murderers that are doing life in prison in a high security yard. And what you don't, you get to see kind of a fellowship in there, but there's no trust or nothing. And you, this is what you don't see with anybody, mm -hmm. anywhere. So I just want you guys to know from someone who's been with the worst, that you guys got something special going on. And then today I went in and for some reason I wanted to thank him this morning because I, I listened to him and I hear him. So I went in and I just knocked on the door and excuse me, and I talked to you, you can't come in and shut the door. And I wanted to tell him how I was feeling about being out here. I've only been out three weeks, I'm kind of nervous, and, and, and instead of having to tell him, he pretty much told me. <laughs> so I'm starting to wonder, maybe, did he start out in there? <laughs> so the only thing I really want is, is People are only as good as their leader. So, and people just don't start out being good. They don't just walk up to somebody and, and give everything they got to anybody. You guys don't know me. I've been here, this is my second time. She said, call the office, get my number, you need anything. I've had a, a police officer. <laughs>
it's for real. He's, I don't know, him and I have talked about it, and I honestly believe it's for real just because of the way he talks about it. He, he just believes in it. He's comfortable, he's found something he's needed, and he's working, you know, for himself with that. I just see him as a man that just was really ready to live a life, and that's not behind bars. He's, uh, George is a good guy. You ever going back to jail? No. Someday. 